Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, welcome to DigitalOad's first ever AMA stream, talking about Aspire 2. Um, quick introductions. Um, do we want to go, Mike? Yeah. You go first. Introduce <laughs> yourself. Seat. Yeah, you're the yeah. hot seat. So. I'm, I'm Michael Wentworth Bell, so the founder of Load back in 2017 uh, and serve as creative director on the Aspire Games. Sweet. Uh, Okay. Uh, hi. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm Moss. I am a quality assurance tester here at DigitalOad. I've been here for just over a year now. I think my one year anniversary. Last, yeah. last week, week before. I don't know. Time is, time is a weird soup. And yeah. It's flying by. Yes, it um, is. But yeah. Um, hi. Uh, you probably all know me very well. Uh, I'm Sarah. Um, I'm a producer here at DigitalOad. Um, so I like creating issues and asking people to update their Jira boards, uh, as well as many other wonderful things um, that Moss is very familiar with because mm -hmm. we work very closely together all the time in yeah. production QA, which is really fun. Um, aside from that, I do a lot of community stuff, so I'm probably very familiar to a lot of you all because you probably see Lydon and my name everywhere. So hi, I don't have, I'm not green on my Lydon, which is probably good. Um, yeah, I'm here. I've forgotten if there was something else I had to say. No, this was great. <laughs> this was good. We, we, we try to keep it, try to keep it as casual as possible. Uh, so bear with us. We have coffee. I'll have you know. We, we got we got coffee there. He's coffee got coffee. There. Yeah, yeah we got we got plenty of coffee. Don't you worry. Sweet. Um, but yeah, so welcome everyone to our first uh, AMA. Um, uh, today we're specifically going to be talking about uh, the Aspire Two roadmap, uh, where it's come, where it's come, and where it's going. Um, and uh, just a reminder before we get started, if anyone here who's watching live has any questions I'd like to ask, please chuck them in the Ask Devs Anything channel in the Discord. Um, and Sarah's going to be keeping an eye out on that channel to make sure that we need to be answered. But we've already collated a whole bunch of questions from you, a lot of you already, so thank you very much for that. Um, but before we get started, um, what we might start doing is we might start talking about the, uh, the roadmap that did the roadmap this graphic here and actually just go through what uh, we already have planned and what we uh, what we've also done up till now um, so Mike if you want to go through uh, just you know just kind of get step by step um, uh, yeah how was the launch oh, I mean yeah launch of Aspire was very exciting for myself and I'm sure talking for the whole team. Um, for a few of us on the team, it was our, our first game that we've launched and then there's there's a section of us that it's our second, you know, with Aspire uh, 1 being first. And there's a couple of people on the team that have shipped a few titles, so for them it's kind of old hat. But the roadmap has been something we didn't really think about um, before the game uh, launched. We were so heads down on Aspire 2. And so surfacing up, we... We saw heaps of feedback coming um, from the fans on reviews and in Discord. So the roadmap, we hoped, would be a response to what what you all wanted to see. Um, we did a bit of a Venn diagram there of like what, what people want to see and what we could actually achieve as a team, something that, you know, goes to the skill set. So um, those on the Discord might remember we did a survey. It was pretty sweet. If I'm remembering correctly, we had... Um, somewhere around 100 responses, which was, I think, more than I um, expected, which was awesome. And it kind of hoped, for me, it kind of validated the roadmap a lot. We got a lot of suggestions. So in a, in a summary, like that's what we've got, Moss has got up here on the screen, what we're planning to deliver this year. Things like um, voice chat and matchmaking have already launched, which is really sweet. We've actually got a few people in the Aspire development team that have jumped in the chat here as well. And and um, everyone on the team has been really instrumental in launching these updates. But um, it's exciting to, for me to have seen the team deliver the matchmaking voice chat so quick because they are technical, um, you know, undertakings. And most you'd know, uh, having QA them, they're, they're also pretty um, – there's a lot of things that can go wrong with, with matchmaking and, and voice chat. Yeah. Um, it was a big task, both myself and our other QA, Emily, uh, it was a big task to test uh, multiplayer matchmaking. And the fact that we haven't heard anything from the community about things going wrong makes me so happy. <laughs> it means we did our job well. Um, uh, 
Uh, but yeah, so yeah, so we had the launch, uh, the 1.1 tactile update. That was our basically our first like quick hot fix of a whole bunch of stuff that we couldn't get in for launch, but we were able to release pretty soon after launch as well. Um, so that, that went really well. And the way game dev works is there's games go gold, and so there's usually in our cases, you know, a fair few weeks between actually wrapping on Aspire 2 and then actually getting into your hands, and as a result. 1.1 update had a mix of stuff we've been working on for, for nearly a month, as well as once the game finally landed, we had that small amount of time to then uh, hot fix some things that players found that we'd somehow missed. And a big part of that too was the um, collab with B Haptics. It was really fun actually. And uh, I, I was a true believer of the Haptics after actually getting to try it out, um, which was really cool. And, uh, and then we had the 1.2 voice chat update. Uh, which also came about pretty smoothly, I thought, as well. Um, and that was a really big thing that a lot of people really asked for was the ability to chat to each other. Um, so it was really nice to bring that out. Was there anything you wanted to talk about that, that update? No, well, then just, yeah, it was very happy with the... Um, I mean, to only talk to voice chat and matchmaking. Um, all I'll say is as... Um, as as a developer, like um, we, I wish we had it in, in a launch. It was a very strategic decision not to, and um, there was a lot of learnings there to have um, then had to do it post-launch. But very proud to see that we were able to get them in so quick. Um, and now that they are in, hopefully the co-op is going to be exploded because I, I'm, a, I'm a big believer that there isn't a game in VR um, that has a co-op experience that's quite like Aspire Two. Mm. That actually brings up a really good point. Like a lot of the things that we are going to be bringing to Aspire to uh, were things that we wish we could have gotten in at launch. Yeah. And so when we hear from the community about we want voice chat, we want public matchmaking, we we also felt like yes, we really wanted it in there, in there yeah. too as well. So it's really cool to know that like the things that we're passionate to see in Aspire to our community is also very passionate to kind of see as well. Yeah. Um, and uh, yeah, and that kind of leads into the next thing, which is what we're working on at the moment, which is the Spire Ops. So, yeah, speaking um, of that, just quickly, if anyone does have any questions about specifically any of the roadmap content, throw them in, ask the devs. We're super keen to answer anything. Uh, I have been recording a bunch of other general questions that we will get to after we kind of cover the roadmap content. So don't worry, your questions will be answered. But if anyone does want to ask anything about any of the content coming to the game, or if you want to, you know, if you want to know about anything that maybe isn't on the roadmap, but you know. Is anything at all to do with that? And yeah, chuck it, chuck it in, and we'll, we'll answer it best we can. So I guess the first question is, Mike, what is Spire Ops? I, th I think um, looking at that list of players we've got, we've got some um, Pine Cheese, Jetstream, um, Squidward. I think Pine Cheese, for example, um, having played Spire One, it, people are very familiar with our virtual challenges. Um, they, they were super inspired by the VR missions that were in Metal Gear Solid Two, and that was another uh, game mode that we, again, we made a strategic decision not to include at launch. And the idea with Aspire Ops is to try and take the virtual challenges from Aspire 1 and then take them a bit further. But a big difference is to try and frame them a bit as like real world um, ops. It, it, it's only going to be through super light narrative that you see on the like start screen of an op but we're going to kind of shift away from things where they're like totally virtual world, at least for the first few ones that we're pitching. And then the second thing that kind of changes with Aspire Ops is that you've got Cinder and Sooty now. And so the way we're presenting them, you've got game modes. Um, initially, the ones that we're shipping are um, familiar to Aspire 1 players. We've got elimination, takedown, sneaking. And what's different this time is that Sooty's got a path to do the, all the elimination ops. And Cinder does as well. So they, the completion of those is tracked separately per character. As a result, there's separate leaderboards um, for Aspire Ops, which I think hopefully should be pretty exciting because um, a second part of it as well um, is the weekly challenges. That, that's something that um, it's listed in our roadmap on the same update. We've loved them with Aspire 1. It's actually a small team in load that have supported the Aspire challenges every single week. Um, shout outs to, to M and to Cyrus and Tasha, who in particular really kind of set the weekly op, um, tracked, you know, the players. And so we want to take the weekly challenges a bit further. Um, there's probably not too much we can announce at this point, but 
at a high level. Um, Bax, who's recently kind of joined for the marketing strategy, has been pushing really hard to see winners of weekly um, weekly challenges reflected uh, in our Discord through things like roles, um, stuff that I think would be really exciting. And so having a kind of larger pool of, of ops, you know, means that we can have exciting virtual uh, weekly challenges and, and, you know, play around with whether we force you to do this one at Cinder or this week, you can pick anyone you want. Hopefully it means that the leaderboards will be interesting. That's sweet. Um, and a few general questions on Aspire Ops is, will Aspire Ops be co-op? Um, we will have Aspire uh, like co-op missions, but the Aspire Ops game mode will be a single player. That, so we're not going to have the same experience for single player and multiplayer because we worked out that was actually an original thought, but we, we just realised you just can't. It's just a compromise. It's not that fun for single. It's not fun for cops. So we want to do split content. Yeah. Separate. So that way we can focus on making the content for both the single player experience and the multiplayer experience the best it could possibly be for both of those. And we obviously we want to hear from the community. So if you know in the future if there's things that you know the players find that like oh this would be really fun if this was cop or oh I think this was actually I, this kind of sucked because it was multiplayer. You know that's the kind of feedback that we want to receive as well in the future because you know we'll we'll obviously be kind of making updates to the game in the future and we want to kind of keep making the game the best that it can be. So it's it's about making sure that you know you as the player get the best experience at that content. We want to make sure that we're only delivering that best experience. Uh, just to kind of. Um, continue on with that. You you will you won't need to play necessarily the the campaign, the single play campaign, to before you jump straight into the Aspire Ops as well. Um, uh, that they they will be. It's not a thing you have to necessarily unlock. If I'm correct. Yeah, you're correct. Yes. Yes. Yeah, the, and that's deliberately so that you could buy the game on day one, and you could launch the octo whatever our weekly um, developer challenge is without having to then complete the campaign. Neat. Um, all right. Well, let's move on to the next thing. So co-op missions is the next thing on the roadmap. Um, so I guess first question is um, what kind of new co-op missions will be coming? Basically, we, we're going to go down two paths. We put in our um, – when we did a questionnaire to the Discord, we asked would players like to see missions that were more story-focused, like the campaign that we've already shipped, or ones that were more gameplay focused um, with much more of a lighter story. And that was uh, against like how, how much content could we make. We've decided to go towards the gameplay one. And the reason for that, at least for the first few updates, is we can get a lot more content out far quicker. If you do ones that are story heavy, there's a lot of a lot more technical work required in kind of hooking it all up as well as voice acting, localization. So the co-op missions um, that are coming are going to be um, a mix of they're, they're essentially evolved game modes that you've seen in the virtual challenges from Aspire 1. Two that we're looking at at the moment are called Hack and um, Elimination. So Hack is very similar to the hacking well I guess if you've played our first operation in co-op, it's kind of like that but a whole game mode. That's one where you have the, I only know it as Militaris is it Redline? Um Militaris. No, that is Foxhole. Oh, Foxhole. Yeah. So if you've played Foxhole, the first one in um, our co-op campaign, essentially that's a game mode built all around it with a lighter story. And that um, elimination game mode two is an exciting one where if you try the stealth approach as two players, you will um, you'll have a harder time obviously maintaining being Panthers. But if you go loud, that's when um, significant strike teams are called in. And there was obviously more enemies that you need to eliminate. And it should hopefully still be fun whether you want to run and gun or go the stealth approach. It also mean that you won't necessarily have to play the campaign that we already have multiplayer-wise. Like, that will be another, like, Spyro's version of co-op where you can just jump in and play with a friend rather than, you know, oh, we need to experience the story in the campaign that we already have for multiplayer. That's correct. I mean, by the when when we deliver on these two updates, the Esquire Ops and then the, these co-op missions, it's, we're getting to the point where if you want to play single player or multiplayer, you, you have two game modes now. There's campaign mode, and then there's going to be these individual missions at, at which you can kind of play them as you choose. Because with with Aspire One, that was the best bit. You could kind of play a mission or play these shorter uh, game content. So we realised that's the bit we're really missing here. 
I'll never be able to remember the actual level names. Well, every the, every day I wake up, I'm yeah. like, yeah, Sky Office, yeah, Old Metro, yeah. And every time I talk to a community, I'm like, which one is this oh. one actually called? Uh, I'm, I'm exactly the same. And just for, just for everyone, like we, we use like we use code names for levels. Um, but they're not going. They're not the actual names we use for levels when we release them, and it's yeah. it's it's a, it's confusing to like release levels with new names, and then but we preferred to when something in particular like Sky High it was called Sky Office, um, like you just said, Sarah, and uh, yeah, it's confusing sometimes. Yeah. Um, cool. Well, I guess the next thing uh, we got is on the roadmap is new VR platforms. So, uh, Mike. Uh, so what's the deal with new VR platform? You bet. I think it was it was a really challenging one for us to think, should we talk about this, you know, just as a developer? Mm. But we overall decided we do want to let the community know that we're coming to new platforms. And it's one that's um, hard for us, again, to say we are doing this and we're doing it on this date because the nature of game dev is things change all the time. And so what I think I can say... Um, to what new platforms will aspire to come to is essentially um, we would love to see the game come to the major platforms. And for full clarity, what are major platforms? I consider major platforms being um, the standalone quest. We're, we're already there. I see Pico, PSVR2 and Steam as major platforms. And so for full clarity, I'm not saying that it's coming to all of those, but as a player, I would love to see the game come to those platforms, when would it come? I mean, I wish they they were there uh, on launch day or I wish they are there today. And the reason that they weren't as well, just to have a chance to talk about it, is because it was a decision as a developer to focus on one platform initially. We chose the Quest because, one, it's, it's obviously the biggest market, but, two, uh, we, we wanted to design a game that really – like hit the limits and when I'm telling hit the limits we really did hit the limits of you know at least our abilities of the quest you know it's a um, technically limited platform and we have scenes in our game where you've got 19 enemies uh, you know uh, 19 AI agents running at the same time in co-op that was um, a real technical challenge to get that running at 72 frames a second and Spyro 1 was the opposite we relaunched that game and day one it was actually the first VR game to ever launch on every major platform on day one. West, PSVR, Steam, Rift Store. I, I don't think there was ever a game before 2019 that had done it. And boy, did we learn from that. That was a bad idea. Like, I mean, for a first-time developer, it was um, – we, 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 at the time, we were proud of where we got Aspire 1, 2, but we obviously realised we, we didn't spend enough time iterating on the game and so for Aspire 2, it was a deliberate decision. We should focus on one platform first. When that platform's, you know, really solid and secure, we'll move to other platforms. As a QA, I'm very grateful that we released on one headset. <laughs> yeah, yes. Because it means that I, wouldn't, I, didn't have to, I didn't have to switch between headsets or anything. It was just I could focus on the one and yeah. it was like, sweet. One, one might say that we were, we were so preoccupied with whether or not we could that we didn't stop to think about whether or not we should. And, <laughs> yeah. and uh, boy, uh, that, was, that was all changed for Spy 2. And it is a pain, but I think it, it means that when we do deliver it to external platforms, if we can, which we obviously really want to, it will be the best it can be on those platforms. Yeah. And that's really important to us that, like, we're actually giving a good product on those platforms, you know, ready to go on those platforms. And it's funny, uh, some of my friends uh, didn't just at a certain point in their lives had no idea that there are differences between VR platforms. Let's just take controllers, for instance. Um, the Vive has a completely different controller button layout than a Quest 2, for instance. And uh, I was had an argument with my friends one day as someone that works in the industry about, about this very topic. And, and they just say something wasn't computing. And one day I got fed up and I posted a photo of a, of a Quest controller and a Vive controller. And I was like, do you see any difference with these? That one doesn't have a thumbstick. And yeah. then it clicked. And yeah. not, not to, obviously, a lot of work has to go into porting. Yeah. You know, yeah. uh, I have a friend actually that works in the porting industry. Um, mm. And it, it's so much, you know. So that's why we're, you know, like it's so, it was so important for us to make Aspire 2 so good at launch. And we're so excited to hopefully make it good on other platforms mm. too. So yeah, we, wanted, yes, we wanted to, yeah, obviously learn from Aspire 1 and make sure that when it launches on certain platforms, it's going to be, um, the, you know, the best we can do for that platform. And so, 
yeah, it's, it's frustrating to not be able to say, hey, it's going to come to the platform X on this day. We will say that, but when we say it, it'll be um, when we have, you know, very high confidence that that's exactly what's going to happen on that day. Because that's another thing with Aspire One as well. We announced it was coming on this day and, and then when development changed, we realized we had to delay. And so that was actually something we didn't do with Aspire Two, the nature of game dev is actually games do delay. Aspire 2 was delayed three times, but we didn't announce the release date until we knew it was um, not going to delay. Mm. Oh, but if you, if, when it comes to platforms, I think you'll hear it first in the Discord because we are yeah. got, got embarking on a journey here to be as transparent as we can. Um, all right. Uh, next on the list, skins. Uh, I love having skin. Yeah, it's good. <laughs> yeah. I love having multiple skins. Yes, I know. I mean, I've just got the one. Just got the one skin. I'm not going to talk about how many. Yep. I have. <laughs> All right. So, um, so, so, Mark, what kind of skins are coming? Um, again, this was a one that was driven from the community. We had uh, feedback via reviews and also just play tests and um, various other sources bit internally as well, that it'd be good to add skins to the game, particularly a co-op one. The skins that are coming are cosmetic-only skins, um, and that's that's a de deliberate decision from us as developers as well. The frames, so you've got Cinder and Sooty skins as well as weapons. The way we're treating the weapon ones, that they're unique uh, weapons. So if you're uh, – there's quite a lot of skins that the team have already put together, but if we've got, as a most boring example – a lava gun, <laughs> um, that would be treated as a completely uh, unique gun that you've got to now um, uh, find in the environment and acquire and then equip from the firing range. Yeah. Um, and we, we are working on uh, designing at the moment how those skins are going to be unlocked still. So um, It's not set in stone at the moment. So just yes, because Mike yes. says you might have to find it and unlock it from the environment. Uh, that's not a full guarantee at the moment, but we do want to make it engaging and fun. And we're looking, you know, we're looking into ways that we can make it, you know, something like that adds on to the game that isn't just for you to show off your, you know, your personal fashion sense or yeah. personal taste uh, in camouflage. When it comes to stuff, and again, like Sarah's saying, it's not locked in, but we are definitely going in, in the direction of rewarding stealth play. So things like five stars or badges are things that we are leaning into for skins. And that's to reward the stealth gameplay better than it did at launch with, yeah. with you know, skins, and of which where we have, like, common, rare and epic skins just in terms of how hard are they to, to actually find and unlock. Mind Jeeves actually has a question about skins. Um, they're saying, uh, are you worried about the armory running out of gun wall space if skins are something that you have to, uh, as we're describing skins? I think that's also something that we are working on is how do you appropriately, you know, equip those skins. Obviously, they're going to be, we're going to probably most likely have skins for um, the guns that already exist in the game. So there'll be there'll be like a separate object, but it, it, it won't be like a separate gun that then adds onto the armory wall. So but we are looking into ways to make that UI and UX work with the game and allow you to comfortably browse your skins and select your skins. As you so please, I, I hate talking about skins. Like yeah. it's, so, it's so weird. I'm sorry. But why are video game terms so weird? Um, anyway, um, the frame side of it, I think there's there's a mock up that we're working towards for um, selecting, and, and I'm yeah probably too early to really sh to talk too much, but I'm very happy with it. I think it's going to be really exciting. Yeah, you're yeah. going to love our skins. Yeah, you know, I will say uh, the art team have been smashing it. Absolutely. Like, I'm very excited for you all to see what, what they've been cooking. They just yeah, yeah, sure. I, I, I think it's time. Like in terms of sharing some, uh, we should chat with our art lead, Aladar, about just like getting some, yeah, over. And also it's a great place to get feedback as well. So, yeah. 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 So uh, well, please stay posted for. Yeah, uh, stay stay posted on that. We will, yeah. uh, you know, you, you'll find out, and probably first place is the Discord. Yeah. So tell your friends. Yeah, tell your friends to come fine. check out our skins. Um. <laughs> you got you got you, no 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 no. I, I, you got to get permission from Aladar first. You got to go through Aladar. Yeah. <laughs> I'll tell him to say no. Yeah. No no. 
Um, yeah. <laughs> uh, one one question that has come up before in the community is like, will skins cost money? Yeah, I think um, as a VR developer, um, I guess you probably talk as well as like, would skins change gameplay too? Like, uh, at one point, it would be pretty sweet if we could put a few skins up that are cosmetic only that we would charge some cash for. And I'm, again, just talking is more on the creative director. I'm one of obviously the business owners. I think it's it's a way to have a cosmetic only option if fans do want to support development of the game. Um, that would be, you know, ho- hopefully an option. We've never explored in-app purchases in our games or DLCs. We've also thought a lot. VR is a really interesting industry. We're a company that at the moment don't intend to do paid DLCs because Paid DLCs also split the community up a lot. You have, if we were to charge for a mission pack, at least this is our current thinking, you may be in a case where you've got only a small subset of players that can can play it. And obviously we've thought a lot, there's different ways you could look at it. Skins are something that we've seen a lot of other VR apps do with like cosmetic only hats and stuff like that, that we thought we could at some point maybe have a few of our Epic skins that we then do put, um, as in-app purchases. But I think I'll say at the same time, we have no plan to have any gameplay modifications on the on the skins because we also thought, again, that could lead into a territory where having some paid skins is, is, is pretty annoying for players, but also um, it, it was a decision too that we could allow to have some more interesting and fun skins. So there are some skins that are a bit oddball and they won't do things like um, lower the, the health or armour of a character or make you easier or harder to see for the guards. That's the decision we've made for skins. Mm. And at least initially with our first few drops, we don't intend to have any at this point that are um, in our purchases. Um, but, but we down the track, if if we if the game is supported and actually to the skins are popular, we will we'll probably try out seeing if in our purchases are popular or not. Just just on that as well, uh, coffee is really expensive right now because the economy is in shambles. <laughs> So every skin buys us a coffee. This is what we <laughs> oh, that's a joke. That's a joke. Coffee is expensive, um, and the economy is in shambles. Yeah. Um, but you know, just just think think from your heart when you know <laughs> if we release skins for, for money, and you're like, how dare you just just think about us buying coffee? Remember us, please. Uh, cool. <laughs> uh, one community question we got is: uh, Will Aspire to ever have mod support in the future? It's not on our 2023 roadmap. It's definitely something that when we released a survey in December, uh, a significant amount of players asked that question. Um, We're actually chatting at the moment with some different VR devs that are doing it. I'm a a fan of um, X-Real Games, the guys that do, and girls that do Zero Calibre, um, Gambit and stuff like that, and following... Um, their story, they've got mods coming to Zero Calibre. Obviously, there's great success stories as well with Contractors, Blade and Sorcery, Bone Lab. Mod support wasn't some our strategy or something we've ever done. And so no one in the team is currently working on mod support. However, I think in the community and the team, there is an interest to, to want to do it at some point. I, I, I think it would be unlikely that we'd do it in 2023. Yeah. Mm-hmm. But if we did do it, I think it's something I'd like to see, obviously, aspire to the the strategies across uh, a game that is on multiple platforms. So we'd like to see, you know, mods that could go across those platforms. Cool. Um, before we move on to questions from the community, uh, I think it'd be really sweet to answer this other question that we have that just came in on the stream. The Squidward wants to know about hardcore difficulty. Uh, they ask, are we going to have something like where there's no checkpoints and you can only be hit once? And they did ask earlier as well, like, what what is the deal with hardcore difficulty if we can kind of give any more information about how that's going to work? Hardcore difficulty. So the first question, um, I haven't seen a pitch for, like, a um, no checkpoint, one hit kills player in our current one. I think it's a cool idea. Mm-hmm. And I will say that the survey, again, we had the last question, which was, what are your ideas? There was quite a lot of awesome ideas about hardcore mode. That wasn't one of them. So we're currently designing the hardcore mode, and it, the intent is it's probably more of like a later in the year. First, we've got this, the single-player ops and then the co-op missions, weekly challenges. And so as for, like, where is the current hardcore mode design, again, things could change. 
was very, very early um, on it. But at a hard level, uh, at, a, at a high level, it's um, looking at adding a, a hardcore difficulty. We, we do have like a two ways to play right now, story and normal. And hardcore, ideally, if we deliver on what we're current thinking, a way to replay the entire campaign, um, single player and co-op, and see, uh, have much more of a challenge. I think the current plan is to disable the ability for Aspire Vision to see enemies through walls. You can still obviously use Vision to mark them with line of sight, obviously make it significantly um, harder to, to sustain damage from the guards, increase enemy AI, adjust things like sight lines, uh, weapon effectiveness, limit trank darts, because trank darts um, would seem to make life a lot easier, and also change encounters up. So some things might be adding more electronic threats when there weren't previously, or maybe previously in old Metro you're seeing X class, like second unit soldiers that are now supplanted by heavies uh, or like the heavy weapon specialists and things like that, and also just how we do combat. So there's a, there's a few different areas that we think a hardcore mode would be a compelling reason for someone to want to replay the campaign again um, for that extra challenge. Yeah, so it's still very much in terms of hardcore mode, you could say it's quite early days still in terms of all the ideas are up in the air at the moment. It's just trying to figure out exactly like, what are the what are the very um, core points of hardcore mode and how it should function, yeah. Yeah, and our current like active development is on the single player and co-op uh, campaign, co uh, you know, mission content, sorry. Uh, cool. Uh, good to move on to community questions. Yeah. Uh, so this, these, all these questions are submitted by all of you. So thank you so much for everyone who submitted a question. Yeah, and feel free to keep submitting questions if you have anything else you want to ask us while we're here. So we'll go through the ones that have been uh, submitted already. And if anyone has anything new, uh, we can add them on at the end. Yes. So uh, first question. Uh, looking back at old Aspire 1 footage, I'm reminded that Baker had a dog. What happened to Baker's dog after Aspire 1? I think it's not a spoiler to say that Baker didn't survive the events of Spire 1. Um, you, if you've played Spire 2 for more than about four minutes, that, that's that's revealed. So um, I'm not the narrative designer, so I'm not sure what happened to a dog. I would love to see well, someone else on the Aspire um, team, maybe Dector or someone adopting that dog or um, family-wise. The actual background is Baker's dog is my dog. His name's Bean. Uh, so seeing Baker's dog in the room, that's that's my dog being in real life being is, is very well. He's doing good. Uh, next question is what has been your favorite part of making the Aspire games? And I think we could all like have a have a crack at answering that question. Very good. Why are you putting me in the hot seat? Right, I'll, 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 I'll go first. Yeah. I'll go first. Uh, favorite part of making the Aspire games. Um uh, for me, like I said before, like I've been with Digital Load for just over a year now, um, and uh, I can probably say that my VR experience was quite limited before uh, I started here at Digital Load. So it's been really, really cool, kind of getting to not to not only dive into Aspire, um, uh, but also other big VR games as well. It's completely opened my opened my. Uh, my world view in terms of VR experiences and what's possible with VR. And yeah, it's really, really cool. So yeah, just getting to play VR is pretty awesome. Well, uh, hey, Bax, can you just quickly confirm for us that the stream's still going okay? Just had a user report that it might have cut, but I'm not sure if that's on their end or if it's universal. That's still looking good. Well, that's all good. Sweet. Might just be our local issues. Yeah, I mean, uh, now that I've had a chance to become not head empty, no thoughts about that question. Um, yeah, my favourite part has honestly been, um, I mean, I came on board um, during Aspire 1 after it had launched, uh, after it had been out for about a year, and that was really exciting. But I think for me, um, the big thing has been working on Aspire 2. It's been really exciting seeing levels go from basically almost nothing, something very simple where you have to use a lot of imagination. And I'm, I'm pretty good at that already. I've always had a very active imagination. So for me, looking at a, a grey box level, but being told what the premise is, I'm fine with that, but it's still nonetheless exciting seeing that grey box level turn into the final release. Like every, you know, new lighting build where, you know, we've got beautiful sunlight god rays coming through the windows of, of Sky High, I almost said Sky Office. Um, every, you know, update where, you know, um, a new uh, updated kind of mesh has been added where we previously were using something cobbled together literally with duct tape digitally speaking. 
um, and literal grey boxes, that being t- suddenly transformed by the artist into something, you know, shining and new is so exciting. And seeing the, the levels become what they are and build up over time and gradually having things put in and replaced and taken away and pushed and pulled and adjusted and tweaked is really, really cool. And even small things like for a very long time, uh, while we were live editing the script and adjusting pacing, we had uh, text-to-speech uh, inserted into the game through Unreal Engine. And that was to allow us to basically make sure that if we needed to trim elements of the script down to fit the pacing and the, and the timing of the game that we could before we finalise and record with our voice actors. Um, and, you know, some of my fondest memories are just hearing people in the work office just suddenly say, good the building. Uh, in a very, very tone-deaf robotic voice because we just got so used to hearing the same robot lines saying the same phrases with the same dodgy pronunciation for a very long time. But it was so fresh when those voice lines got put in and suddenly it was replaced with actual human speaking and yeah. beautiful voice lines and everything. So that, yeah. was, that was one of the moments when we got, like, the voice actors' recordings in the game that it was just like, oh, this is really cool. This is really, really cool. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It was very exciting working on that part of it. How about you, Mike? I think um, both of you have covered a lot of, for me, the favourite parts, but really hard one to answer. I think, for me, the really top favourite part, having now done two Aspire games, is launching them. <laughs> I mean, it's awesome to finally get them out, but also the, looking back on Aspire 1 and now 2, I think, at least as a director, the, for me, the favourite part is the post-launch. Like, after the games come out, I'm a terrible junkie for, like, reading reviews in the morning, seeing what players are doing. I have uh, shortcuts on my desktop to just search YouTube, Reddit, um, Twitter for just Esquire, what are people saying? Because it it is really fun to be spending two years making a game, thinking people will do it this way, and just watching streams and going, hey, they did, or no, they didn't. You know, like, and that's why I think I'm excited about trying to make sandbox games where there is a bit of agency, um, you can play them a bit yourself, and I love seeing things like, um, that, especially the speed running, when you, when you players, you know, like um, found a way to like shoot yourself in the chest in a spiral one with a trank launcher to phase through doors. And I was <laughs> laughing for hours thinking, wow, that's amazing. Yeah. And I think that's why it's, it, it's and, and you also get instant feedback, well, not instant, but you spend two years making a game, you've got play testing happening, but to be able to do updates, fairly regularly and see leaderboards grow and see streams. Like it's, it's, it is, I think at least me, super, it's probably my favorite part just to kind of go, wow, that was um, from doing a, you, you can do post release content here and have it in the hands of players like quicker. Yeah, we, we love speedrunners at the studio and it's oh, always, yeah. it's so, it's, it's an occasion when, you know, we come into work and someone's like, did you see this, you know, such and such that broke another record on this mission? Like they got a, a time of like 28 minutes. We're like, oh, my yeah. God. A bunch, of us, a bunch of us love like speedrunning as well. Like, I, yeah. I, I, I in particular enjoy, yeah, Moss is insane. enjoy, enjoy speedrunning. I think Moss still has the um, top the world record for mission one, which I think for for uh, thirty three. Yeah, I, I haven't looked at the I haven't looked at the leaderboards in a couple of weeks, so that could have been. Yeah, I, I was at the top there. From, um, all right. Don't um, look at my time. <laughs> uh, next uh, question is uh, Aspire merch when? Tough one. I think mm-hmm. um, at um, Tripwire Gang. If you want to see merch, we'll also talk to Tripwire too, but. Um, between developer and publisher, it's something we want to just nut out a bit. I think if we're going to see some merch, it's not a promise again, but like ideally, uh, and I know um, Bax and team having joined us recently, big behind things like tournaments or trying to reward like challenges and competition. I can see a world where we're trying to tie some of our merch to that as prizes. In terms of would we ever sell them? Maybe at events, I could see us also. But a, a store, we haven't, I can only say we haven't really gone down that rab- rabbit warren yet. Yeah. So wouldn't see it happening this year. Mm. I think if you do really want to see it and you're super keen, um, you, you know, reach out to Tripwire Presents and politely and gently and don't spam them, but just let them know that it's something that you think you'd love to see in the future because they, you know, they'd obviously be working closely with us with the Aspire uh, franchise IP. So if it's something that you're super keen on, just send them a friendly email once don't do it more than once. That will decrease the chances of merch happening. Yeah. Um, but yeah, um, this this has come up quite a bit. Is uh, will you guys ever release the Aspire One and Aspire Two soundtrack? And I'll say, I think that what to what we we're just talking about, 
we're at the point that, yes, we're working on the E2 soundtrack first. And that's because I'm able to kind of look at, you know, there's various people commenting across Discord, um, different social media and reviews saying release the soundtrack. So it's easier to kind of present that internally and with our publishing partner and go, hey, we should release it. So I can say that our current plan of attack, at least for the E2 soundtrack first, I would love to get the E1 soundtrack as well, is we want to release a, um, a version of it on Spotify that is um, arranged by our composer, Chris. He's actually upstairs at the moment um, working on it right now. That, that way anyone can stream and listen to it. And it's you, if you've played Aspire 2, you know that there's quite a lot of music um, tr- like stems and they dynamically change as you play. So we're going to be presenting uh, each mission as a track really, but it's uh, arranged so that it goes for that flow. And that'll be for free for streaming. We also intend to then at the same time sell the full soundtrack. Um, don't know how much yet, but would just be whatever's in line with soundtracks. And that's like legit the same thing that we have in the game. So it's the full stems. And that's going to be hours of, of stuff. Because just um, Polygon, the mission, is 38 minutes long, the, the music for that. Hopefully that way you've got two ways to listen if you're a uh, hyper fan of the music and you want to listen to just one bit, it's there. If you want to just kind of hear a arranged version of the entire campaign, it's on Spotify and should sound just as wild. Uh, cool. Um, all right. So next question is, why did you, why did you start developing Aspire 2 and what were some of the major things you wanted to implement? Slash implement? Um, yeah, so was there anything in particular, Mike, with, with Aspire 1? like having done that out in the world and then started working on Inspire 2, what was like, was there any particular really big things that you really wanted to be inspired? Definitely realistic reloading was like, I mean, so from a feature side, I'm really happy. I think we delivered on everything we wanted and it was very much, again, player-driven feedback. If you, if anyone that's watching or we, we're recording this too, but I'll say a lot of the features in Inspire 2 were top player requests. To rattle them off the top of my head, it was things like being able to see, being present with IK arms and trying to put tools and equipment onto your body, um, having better AI, the light and shadow system, being able to see in the dark with an X-ray vision mode, um, seeing neck characters, realistic weapon reloading was another huge one, and multiplayer. I think that was number one, the, the thing that players wanted to see, and so they were major things we wanted to improve, implement. And I'll, I'm super biased, but I'll say I think we did. We improved those things or implemented them when they weren't there in the first title. As for um, why did we start developing it, we've always wanted to make uh, these kind of games, like at least I have. You know, Aspire 1 came out. To do another one is a dream. And I think I'll say, too, to do another one will be a dream. I, I don't think we'll be doing one for quite a while. But when the time comes, we, I'll jump at it. And so we started Aspire 2 because Aspire 1, it did pretty well. And, and it's thanks to the players. It didn't do well initially. We, we put our heads down and spent as much time as we could trying to improve scores, listen to players. Um, but particularly on the Quest, it did hella good. It was a top seller in 2020. So we had an opportunity to work again with Meta and Tripwire and make a sequel of our dreams. So... Given that opportunity, we said, hell yeah, heck yes. And that, we've got to grow the company. So that's how Moss and Sarah were able to join because we were, we were a very small team when we finished the Spider One. Sweet. Cool. Um, cool. Um, uh, I'm just scrolling through the questions you've got. Uh, uh, if the game comes to PC platform, meaning Oculus, um, will there be cross buy? Good question. I think this is another one that quickly we can't put a promise down because strategies could change. Yeah. So I'll only, only answer to say this. When Aspire 1 launched, it was a cross-buy game. And that means that specifically on the Rift store or the Quest store, if you bought it on one or the other, you were granted access to the other one. And Aspire 1 and 2 if uh, would be considered two different games on PC versus Quest. The PC has... 50 times more power. So I think it's a great deal. So all I'll say personally as a, as, a, as a VR junkie, I believe Oculus or Metagame should have cross-buy. So 
as a player, I'd love to see us do cross by whenever we do multi-platform games on the on the specifically meta platforms. I think it's a no-brainer. Uh, we've got one question here uh, that says, can Mike recreate the face he made when he saw Flying Pigs uh, beating the game in under 30 minutes video? Um, maybe not the face, but like, what was your reaction when you saw that someone had beaten the game in 30 minutes? <laughs> I remember that day. That was a fun day. I, I, um, I think I probably sat there and I just uh, put, put my hand on different parts of my head to like calm the pressure down and I thought... <laughs> It, yeah, I, I was convinced it was impossible. Like, uh, it, mm. especially as a development team that's been working on it for, I'm like, why can't I finish it in 30 minutes? Because when you have to do certain testing of mm. the game, yeah, uh, it takes a long time. So I'm yes. like, oh, that was freed up. <laughs> and so then getting watching the, um, I think my face hearing sub 30 face probably like, yeah, wait, wait, wait before you do that. Okay. But um, getting to watch uh, the video and see the exploits, like in in there's a. I'd say a famous skip now, the flying pig has done to just exit the level via the, the, the roof. And my jaw was just like, why didn't we think of that? <laughs> it's obvious there is a friggin' hole in the ceiling. Of course you can um, find a way up there. Yeah. Yeah. It's that. And then you kind of sit there for a few seconds and you stare at the thing and you think, should we fix it? Like, you know, should we um, put, a, put a gap, put a plug on it? Um. This is an interesting question. How much of Aspire 2's story was actually thought of by the launch of Aspire 1? Did you even have the idea of Aspire 2 in your head at the time of Aspire 1? Oh, definitely. I think Aspire 1 was actually the, the really the first third of a, a bigger story just because the ambition was way too high. And by the time we finally um, had Aspire 1 greenlit, we had lowered the scope to what is Aspire 1. That was meant to be the first few missions and we turned it out to a full game. Um, and so started, when Aspire 1 launched, there was already a pitch for, well, Aspire 2 is just going to be the next half of it. I will say, though, it completely changed. Like, I mean, not completely, but many, many elements of the story, once we actually finally, um, you know, the dust settled and had time to kind of, like, creatively reduce and everything, um, the, the story did change a lot. But um, at the time, I'd say, yeah, it was, so the answer is no, it wasn't really planned. We thought it was. Well, we knew, I think, that it was going to happen and some major beats we knew were going to be in there, but all the things, I think, did change. Yeah. All of the and minor details. We did a similar thing, too. With, with Aspire 2, at a certain point, we did cut um, the last third of the game and then re-change the story. So there's, again, another story that we, should, we could, you know, tell in the future. Yeah. yeah. That yeah. kind of answers another one of our questions, actually, which was um, if, if there was a plan for an alternate ending of Aspire 2. Um, because of the rocket in Operation 7 does launch and it doesn't go anywhere, uh, and there is just the one ending that it's on a multi-ending game. So there's definitely um, was more story planned. Uh, so potentially, as you said, maybe you'll see it come out in the future. Yeah. Maybe we'll uh, maybe we'll do a video series. Mm. Maybe we'll, we'll make a Netflix movie. That was a joke. <laughs> um, I don't think we should do that. Um, well, you, you kind of touched on this earlier as well, Mike, that with Aspire 2, Digilow did grow as a team a whole bunch. And so we did, you know, there was a lot of new people in the studio and a lot of people with like different levels of expertise and different things. And so just, you know, everyone kind of bringing, you know, whole, all these new ideas and things like that, that definitely like aspire to really benefit from that having like so many amazing people in this company. Um, Absolutely. Uh, this is a fun one. Would you be open to an aspire? And I expect you to die crossover. Yeah, I think we're open to any crossover. I mean, we're currently on sale with uh, Vertigo Games after the fall. I thought, is there a crossover we could do that? Sure. I mean, so, yeah, when it comes to I Expect You to Die, that was actually the very first VR experience I ever played in my life. In 2014, oh, wow. they had a, it was just a demo. It was, it was a, the top-rated Oculus DK2 demo. So I love that game. Um, could we do a crossover? Yeah. We will, let's, if anyone's got any connections at Shell Games, our CEO does, maybe we'll pitch it to him. Okay. Um, let's grab a couple more questions. We kind of talk, talked about this a little bit, but did the final result of Aspire 2 when it launched, how close did it actually come to what you had envisioned and, and planned for the like two years of development? It came... Um, I guess at a high level, it was close to what we'd planned. To do a game that was much more focused on stealth 
that had more, a lot more effort into story, like really bringing story out, and that also pushed for co-op. And, and another goal for us as well from the outset was to try and simplify the game. I think we got a bit closer. That was where some decisions of like trying to multi, um, combine a few tools into one and cut a few kind of came from. I guess in terms of like um, how did it go in terms of how we plan, I think very different. Yeah. <laughs> like um, what, what, what's your nickname, Sarah? The scope. The scope. <laughs> the, the scope slash uh, strikes again at midnight. Um, I mean, that, that sounds really harsh, but a lot of my job is helping make sure that we're not biting off more that we can chew and that we are able to actually deliver on our promises and, and actually kind of do what we want to do. And if we can't, I, I'd like to help facilitate conversations about how can we actually do that? What's a compromise? Um, and just kind of helping make sure that we're not, we're not spreading out into many different directions or that, you know, what, what we ideally want to do isn't too out of reach. But then it's like, but what can we do? What do we have available to us? What are our resources? What are our people's skills? And what can we do within that? So there's, um, a, there's a lot of features yeah. and, and stuff that, yeah, on the outsource, we plan to have in the game that we cut because they just weren't stealth game features. We had a third frame and it was massive. We were 12 foot tall, codenamed Panda. Uh, you had a, a you know a shield that was uh, essentially like a vortex shield, and we were playing it. And I'm like, this is extremely fun. This isn't a stealth game anymore. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, and that's a, that's a big thing I think about making video games is it's really easy for you to think of cool ideas, but a really important thing is is the pillars of your game. And at the end of the day, looking at it, being like, well, what is this game supposed to be? And that should be limited, especially if you're a small studio. You can't. If you're like five people, it's probably not a very good idea to try and make an MMO. Like, it's probably not a good idea. Not that you can't, but it's going to be hard and to make it comparable to something like Blizzard, really, really tricky, right? So I think a big thing is, is looking at, you know, what you can do and then from there being like, let's say you did want to make and some kind of an RPG of that, that analogy. Well, what are your pillars? Like, how many things do you want to have in it? And then being like, well, how many of those can you reasonably do? And for us, a big thing you know, even further more granular to that is what is the core aspects of our game? And stealth, obviously, is one. We wanted to make a stealth game. And a giant 12-foot-tall robot that can go and mega punch people doesn't really fit in stealth, but that doesn't mean that idea gets thrown in the bin. Because it's a good idea, it just doesn't fit with this game. So a huge thing is, you know, there's heaps of good ideas out there, but they don't always fit with the project that you're trying to make. And it's not necessarily a good idea to make them fit with the project. Sometimes it is, sometimes it isn't. But I like to, to say we're going to shelve it. We're not going to we're not going to cut it. It's not going to end up on the floor to be trampled on. We're going to shelve it because who knows what will happen in the future? Who knows what good ideas we prototype? We might want to go. Let's return to that. And you know, I think it's really important to not throw away those ideas, especially if they're good and especially if they're fun, because that's always something that you can go back to later and go. You know what? Let's let's investigate that more. Let's test that out in the game jam. Let's have a play around with that. You know. Totally. Sweet. Uh, well, I think that is. Everything, uh, that's all we can do for today. Um, massive thank you to everyone who has been uh, hanging around and uh, thank you to everyone who asked questions as well. We really appreciate it. This is something that we want to do more often. Absolutely. Um, so definitely keep an, keep an eye out in the, the Discord and on our socials for when we're going to do another one of these. Um, could be could be an AMA, could be something else, but we definitely want to have this more kind of like face to face engagement with the community. So um, yeah, uh, thank you everyone for um, hanging out. Um, yeah, who knows? Maybe I'll just live stream myself drinking coffee and slashing scope. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <Silence. laughs> sweet! Uh, uh, thank you again, everyone. Uh, we will see you in the Discord channels. Um, have have a great rest of your day. Have a great weekend. Thanks, everyone. Cheers. Thank yeah. you.